what does it mean to be an American? While the answer may vary depending on who you ask, there are certain qualities that are universal. America is known for its technical innovation. We're a very creative country. America is also known for its rugged individualism. We like to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. This is one of the reasons why self-help is such a large industry here. Probably the biggest of them all, however, is that America is a capitalist country. We believe in a free market, business competition, and of course, making a lot of money. Every society has an archetype, a person that fully embodies their values. Perhaps no one embodies America more than the man of this episode. This is the story of Henry Ford. Henry Ford was born on a farm in Springwells Township, Michigan, on July 30th, 1863. He was one of the five children of William and Mary Ford. At the age of 12, his father gave him a pocket watch. Like all curious children, young Henry dismantled the watch, but unlike most curious children, he successfully reassembled it. Young Henry Ford displayed a mechanical aptitude. He would go around dismantling and reassembling the timepiece of friends and neighbors, earning him the reputation of a watch repairman. At the age of 12, Ford's mother died from childbirth complications, a life-changing event for young Henry Ford. He would go on to say, I never had any particular love for the farm. It was a mother on a farm that I loved. Not having any affinity for farming, Henry Ford left home three years later to work as an apprentice machinist in Detroit. Ford would continue working several mechanic jobs throughout the city, and would also periodically come back home to work on a family farm. During this intermittent period, he was also hired by Westinghouse to service their steam engines. He traveled around repairing machines and studied bookkeeping at the Detroit Business Institute. At the age of 25, Henry Ford married Clara Jane Byrant on April 11, 1888. The couple had one child together, Edsel Ford, whom we will see more of later in this episode. Ford's first big break came when he was hired as an engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company in Detroit. He rose through the ranks quickly and two years later, he was promoted to chief engineer at Edison. Ford was just 31 years old at the time. The executive role gave him the time and capital to begin experimenting on gasoline engines. These experiments culminated in 1896 with the completion of a self-propelled vehicle he named the Ford Quadricycle. On the night of June 4, 1896, Ford made a test run of the quadricycle. There were a few bumps here and there, but the trip was mostly successful. At 33 years old, Henry Ford had made his first car. Another major event also happened in 1896. Ford was introduced to Thomas Edison at an executive meeting. Edison liked Ford and approved of his automobile experimentation. With a blessing from the Wizard of Menlo Park himself, Ford resigned the Edison company and founded the Detroit Automobile Company in 1899. Ford was capable of producing a car, but not at the cost and margin to make a successful business run. The automobiles produced by the Detroit Automobile Company were of low quality and had higher prices than Ford wanted. The venture was not successful, and the company was dissolved two years later in 1901. This was Ford's first failure. Like all entrepreneurs, Ford did not give up after this defeat. He designed and built a 26-horsepower automobile. In order to gain publicity for this new car, Ford did something clever. He began race car driving, and to everyone's surprise, Ford won. Using this publicity, Ford found backing and formed the Henry Ford Company with the help of William Murphy on November 30th, 1901. A year later, Murphy bought Henry Leland as a consultant, a move Ford did not approve of. As a response, Ford left the company bearing his own name. With Ford gone, Leland renamed the company to Cadillac. Another failure for Ford, but Cadillac would go on to make history. With two failures now, Ford still did not give up. He sought and received backing from a man named Alexander Malcolmson, a Detroit area coal dealer. Malcolmson later bought another group of investors, which included the Dodge Brothers, founder of the Dodge Car Company. Together, 
They incorporated a new enterprise named the Ford Motor Company in 1903. Henry Ford was now 40 years old. The first car of the Ford Motor Company was the Model A. Over 1,000 Model A's were sold after a year, so Ford was experiencing modest success by now. Meanwhile, the company was working on the Model B, a larger, more expensive vehicle than the Model A. The idea of selling luxury cars did not sit well with Ford, however. Coming from a farm, his dream was to produce automobiles for the masses. For cultural and historical purposes, let's pause here to appreciate how disconnected the average American was before the automobile. During the early 1900s, transportation outside of railroads was terrible. Since cars were enormously expensive, only the wealthy could afford this luxury. Most Americans used horses or traveled by foot. This condition was especially brutal for people who lived in rural areas. If you lived on a farm, getting around on land is one of the biggest problems you have. The point that you viewers must grasp is that transportation was a high pain point for people during that time. This collective pain point was the primary drive behind Ford's vision. Henry Ford bought this vision into the shop and tinkered until the ideal car for the everyday man came into reality. The result? The Model T. A simple, rugged, reliable automobile that can handle pretty much any terrain. Most importantly, the Model T was cheap. Its price? Just $850. Upon release, the car was an immediate success. And due to its price, the average man and woman was waiting in line to get their hands on a Model T. Henry Ford had succeeded in making the automobile for the masses, but with that success brought another problem. His production line could not support the demand. The Ford Motor Company could literally not produce cars fast enough. At the time, Ford's craftsmen working at stationary benches were producing 25 Model Ts a day. But 25 was far from enough. While visiting a meat packing plant in Chicago, Henry Ford saw carcasses hung from the ceiling, progressing through the plant to different workstations where the cow was processed. Ford stood there, watching the beef go from station to station, and processed specifically by different train workers, who did only one task to the meat. A light bulb went off in Henry Ford's head. He figured that he could put together a car the same way these butchers were taking apart a cow. On August 19, 1913, a rudimentary assembly line was put together. Using that system, a Ford Model T was completed in 12 and a half hours. After a few weeks of refinement, the system was able to produce a Model T in six hours. Within a year, in 1914, it took just 90 minutes to make a car. Ford had established the first assembly line in the world. With production getting more efficient, Ford was also able to cut several hundred dollars off the price of his car. By 1915, a brand new Model T would cost just $440, about $17,000 of today's money. Consumers bought more than 15 million Model Ts. To give you some perspective, America had a population of just 97 million at the time. Ford's dream of bringing the automobile to the masses had become a reality. Model Ts were being produced at a fast pace. But this too came at a cost. Ford employees faced unbearably long, arduous, and monotonous work. You see, the assembly line replaced a craftsman with a low-skill worker performing a single task. Doing one arduous task all day is enough to make any person go numb. And it showed. The company was bleeding workers. Employees found the work so monotonous and physically exhausting that most quit within a few days. The high turnover required a constant hiring and retraining of workers, which was very expensive. So something had to be done. After some thinking, Ford came up with an answer. The $5 workday. The Ford company was going to pay more than twice the going rate. To give you some perspective, $5 in 1913 is equivalent to $200 today when adjusted for inflation. This payment was so high that it became front page news across the country, and workers flocked to the Ford company as a result. Most other companies thought Ford was foolish for offering such a high wage, but contrary to everyone's expectation, it worked. The high turnover rate ceased to exist, and Ford was selling Model T's like hotcakes. Having created an automobile for the masses, formed the first assembly line, and redefined wages in America, Henry Ford was now a bona fide legend. 
He became so wealthy that he bought out all his stockholders. The only shareholders of the Ford company was himself, his wife, and his son Edsel, with Ford being the majority shareholder. Ford was now one of the richest men on earth. He was America's second billionaire, second to only John D. Rockefeller. Ford was now swelling with power and had no other shareholder to keep him in check. With this newfound confidence, he began to share his ideas with the world, and these ideas were tainted with anti-Semitism. Through a newspaper he had bought called the Dearborn Independent, Ford blamed the Jewish people for pretty much anything under the sun, from the World War to currency manipulation, short skirts, degenerate movies, and even jazz music. Here's an excerpt from the book The International Jew. The Jew is the world's enigma, poor in his masses, yet he controlled the world's finances, scattered abroad without country or government, yet he presents a unity of race continuity which no other people has achieved. Living under legal disabilities in almost every land, he has become the power behind many a throne. Capital here in America is usually money used in production, and we mistakenly refer to the manufacturer, the manager of work, the provider of tools and jobs. We refer to him as a capitalist. Oh no, he is not the capitalist in a real sense. Why? He himself must go to capitalist for the money with which to finance his plans. There is a power yet above him, a power which treats him far more callously and holds him in a more ruthless hand than he would ever dare display to labor. There is a super capitalism, which is supported wholly by the fiction that gold is wealth. There is a super government, which is allied to no government, which is free from them all, and yet, which has its hands in them all. There is a race, a part of humanity which has never yet been received as a welcome part, and which has succeeded in raising itself to a power that the proudest Gentile race has never claimed, not even Rome in the days of her proudest power. It is becoming more and more the conviction of men all over the world that the labor question, the wage question, the land question cannot be settled until first of all, this matter of an international supercapitalistic government is settled. To the victors belong the spoils is an old saying, and in a sense it is true that if all this power of control has been gained and held by a few men of long despised race, then either they are supermen, whom it is powerless to resist, or they are ordinary men whom the rest of the world has permitted to obtain an undue and unsafe degree of power. Unless the Jews are supermen, the Gentiles will have themselves to blame for what has transpired, and they can look for rectification in a new scrutiny of the situation and a candid examination of the experiences of other countries. Henry Ford, The International Jew, May 22, 1920 It is important to say that the Dearborn Independent was not small. By July 1926, the paper had over 900,000 subscribers. The public was outraged at Ford's remark, and he was forced to apologize. He ordered the closing of the Dearborn Independent at the end of 1927. But a decade later, in July 1938, Henry Ford accepted Germany's Grand Cross, the highest honor the Third Reich can bestow on a foreigner. This would tarnish his reputation forever. Another strange experiment from Ford was his creation of the sociological department. Ford hired over 200 social inspectors to probe the private life of his workers. They would randomly inspect the employee's house for cleanliness, alcohol, fraud, adultery, and so on. If a worker failed inspection, he was not paid $5 a day. His pay was cut to $2.34 a day. His additional wages were held until the second inspection. If the employee failed the second inspection, he was fired. I'd like to use this as an example to show my libertarian viewers that private companies can be just as tyrannical as the state. See my video on capitalism versus socialism for more on the subject. In the year 1929, the stock market crashed. The Great Depression had begun. America was facing high unemployment and car sales plummeted. This led to the Ford company letting go of workers. The employees who were not fired found their wages cut. As the recession deepened in 1932, a crowd marched on Ford's Rouge plant demanding work. Police had warned the crowd to flee, but shouts were ignored. Police attacked and a full-scale riot broke out. Without warning, the police opened fire on the crowd. Dozens of men were wounded, and four people were killed in what became known as the Ford Massacre. This was another public blow to Ford's image. 
the final blow came when Henry Ford discovered that his son Edsel, who at the time was president of the Ford Motor Company, had terminal stomach cancer. Henry Ford loved Edsel dearly, but was often mean to him in an attempt to toughen him up as an executive. Edsel was not that kind of person, however, so the relationship with his father did not improve his condition. Edsel Ford died in May 1943 at the age of 49. Henry Ford, who was 80 years old at the time, was shattered. After Edsel's death, Henry Ford once again took the head of the Ford Motors Company, but he suffered multiple strokes and his health was failing. The Ford Motor Company had obligations to the military for producing warplanes for World War II at the time. They were falling far behind their quotas, and the family pressured Ford to resign and make his grandson, Henry Ford II, president of the company. With the company now behind Henry Ford, he spent his time in a country. On an April evening in 1947, Henry Ford laid his head on his wife's shoulders and passed away. He was 83 years old. Thousands of people came to pay respects at the great man's funeral. Depending on your biases, you may see Ford as an American hero, a man who lifted himself from rags to riches by producing the automobile for the masses, a genius capitalist who paid his workers incredibly well while still making a profit for himself. You can also choose to see Ford as a racist corporate tyrant who subjugated his workers to secret police and social inspectors. Neither side is incorrect. It all depends on what angle you are looking at him from. This dual nature is in all of us. I argue, however, that instead of focusing on one side of Mr. Ford, view him as a whole. See the good and the bad. And without a doubt, you will see that his good far outweighs his shadow. See you next time. What's going on, guys? This is James Allen. I have a few announcements I'd like to make, so I figured I'd put it at the end of the episode. So the first thing I'd like to announce is that me and William, he was my co-founder, uh, we're no longer together. We decided to go our separate ways, unfortunately, but it was a very amicable breakup, so there was nothing like hostile about it. However, the fact that William and I are no longer together, that means I do not have a CTO anymore, which means I will have to code the app myself. Now, I was in charge of video production before that while William was doing all the programming, but since he's gone now and I'm not getting a new developer, I'm basically gonna code the Cityscape app myself. So what does this mean? This means then, since I am now doing both the development and the video production, you know, things are gonna go a little slower. This means that you might not get an episode every two weeks. I might try uh, about to do every three weeks, um, or I might even try to keep it up at every two weeks, but it's highly unlikely because, you know, I have to build an app by myself. So that's the first announcement. Since William and I have part ways, you know, video production is gonna go a lot slower. The second thing I want to basically say is not really an announcement. It's more like a, it's more like a heads up. If you want to follow the progress of the application of the Cityscape application, you could follow me on Instagram. I'm gonna put it at the um, title credits at the end. Also, the last thing I'd like to leave you guys with, especially giving this episode about Henry Ford, that is, you know, America has become very financialized. You know, uh, our main economic activity has become you know, speculation and investment. Now, I have no problem with finance, but I do think it's bloated as an industry and we do not have enough people like Henry Ford who's producing actual things for people to consume. Now, a product can be digital as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a physical product, but I do think a country's wealth is definitely based on production, not financialization. So uh, you young people that are watching my content, YouTube says there's a lot of you people who are 18 to 26 watching this, um, Please stay away or at least tame the speculation and uh, produce as much stuff as, uh, as you can. So that's it for this episode, guys. Uh, I'll see you next time, like always. <laughs>